My name is uh, Jan Spenar. I'm a professor here and director of the Center on Global Economic Governance. That's one of the co-sponsors of today's event. So uh, let me welcome you also on behalf of the uh, center. It's a wonderful occasion to have this uh, all day of uh, symposia uh, uh, panels. And um, I would like to very much uh, uh, welcome everybody for the keynote address today, which is given by uh, Joe Stiglitz. Um, for many of you, uh, he needs no introduction, but let me just run down a little bit of uh, his bio. So he is um, a Columbia University professor. He teaches across uh, different units, business school, economics department, School of International Public Affairs. He um, serves as uh, co-chair of the high-level expert group on measurement of economic performance and uh, social progress at OECD. Uh, also as the chief economist of the Roosevelt Institute here in New York. He is co-founder, co-president of the Initiative for Policy Dialogue, which has published a number of influential uh, treatises and books over the years. He was awarded the uh, Nobel Memorial Prize in Economics in 2001, was cited for his work from the analysis of markets with asymmetric information. He was awarded the John Bates Clark Medal in 1979, and he served also as uh, a lead author of the 1995 uh, report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which shared the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize. <coughs> He is the former vice president and chief economist of the World Bank, also a former member and chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors, U.S. Council of Economic Advisors, and his uh, most recent book is Globalization and its Discontents Revisited, and Anti-Globalization in the Era of Trump. Uh, Joe uh, knew Ken Arrow uh, personally as teacher, colleague, friend, and co-author. Uh, they had the fortune of actually working together on a number of projects, both uh, strictly academic as well as the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, Economists for Peace and Security, and uh, Joe was the founder here together with colleagues of the uh, annual Arrow Lecture and Book Series at Columbia University that we're hoping we'll be able to perpetuate uh, going forward. Um, now. Um, if I were now to go into discussing all the areas of economics where Joe contributed, it would take too much time. So it's much easier to ask the question, is there an area that Joe has not contributed to? <laughs> and if you poll the profession, there are some daring people who say, there is uh, no area except econometrics. Uh, I dispute that because I have worked with Joe on empirical type uh, issues, and there, is, there are very few people who are more concerned about uh, empirical uh, data results and the implication for policy. So I'm concluding that there is no area of economics that has not been touched by Joe. So it's my privilege to uh, ask Joe to come and deliver today's lecture. Well, thank you. Uh, first, uh, let me thank all of you for, for uh, coming here to commemorate Ken Arrow. Um, and, uh, Thank you for the presentations, which I think uh, really uh, reflected the depth and breadth of uh, King's work. Uh, there are some to topics we haven't yet come to, but I'm looking at the, the whole program. Uh, some of you were at a similar event at Stanford last month, um, and uh, I, I apologize a little bit because I'm going to repeat some of the things I said there. Uh, my views haven't changed uh, <laughs> since then, uh, but uh, uh, there are some, uh, I'll reflect on some of the experiences of uh, some of what happened there. Uh, the participation at both events reflects the influence of Kent's work and the affection and esteem in which he was held. Uh, Stanford was where he spent almost his entire teaching uh, and research career apart from a short time at Harvard and various uh, sabbaticals, uh, it really is Im impressive in, in, in a world in which there's so much uh, peripatetic uh, life, of which I may be the worst, uh, <laughs> to see somebody who, who really was devoted to one place uh, uh, so much for, for more than a half a, half a century. And when, uh, you know, at that uh, Stanford event, you felt uh, the sense in which he was embedded in that community in which he actually created a, a, a very large uh, community there. 
But New York was where he spent his formative years. He did his undergraduate work at CCNY, still America's premier uh, public city university, with an extraordinarily distinguished faculty working on the, uh, today working on the economics of inequality. He acknowledged the importance of having, uh, let me emphasize these words, emphasize having a free public education in the brief autobiographical remark uh, for the Nobel. For those who don't, that's uh, echoing uh, some views that um, Bernie Sanders has uh, expressed. Um, he, he wasn't, uh, uh, he didn't come out on that uh, issue, but, but uh, what he said in his um, uh, autobiographical remarks for the Nobel, my undergraduate education at the City College in New York was made possible only by the existence of the excellent free institution institution and the financial sacrifices of my parents. Uh, I think he made the right choice uh, to uh, go do his graduate work uh, at Columbia. Now this is not just uh, 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 civic pride, but uh, he, he came here to study under one of our country's most creative economists of time, Harold Hotelling, who was a statistician who was an un, uh, early pioneer in mathematical economics and whose insights into voting have already been talked about, to spatial location, and into intertemporal resource allocation are all uh, fundamental. Uh, almost uh, surely, Arrow would have done great work no matter where he had studied, but there is no doubt of Hotelling's influence and the combination of luck and wisdom uh, that had drawn Ken to Columbia and to Hotelling. It was in particular Hotelling who succeeded in moving him from the statistics department to the economics department. He began uh, doing statistics. And I can't remember exactly the story. Uh, maybe uh, uh, you remember, but. Uh, they offered fellowship money. Yeah, that's what I thought it was. Uh, it was money that uh, <laughs> uh, drove uh, some of this uh, move. But I think it was a good decision uh, nonetheless. It, it, so money sometimes can have a positive effect. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, in these few minutes, I thought I would share some of my own reflections about Ken, about how his work influenced me, about interactions over the years, and about the uh, many causes in which we were jointly uh, engaged. Uh, I first got to know uh, Ken more than 50 years ago in my second year of graduate school at MIT. Ken had come to give a course in general equilibrium theory. This was a big deal, not just because of who was teaching the course, <gasps> but the topic of the course <laughs> itself. MIT specialized in what today are called uh, small toy models. Uh, Ken was the, uh, uh, the kind of course that Ken taught was the kind of course that, was, uh, that one expected to be at the core at Berkeley and Stanford. And uh, so this course was giving us at MIT, you know, things have changed uh, um, <laughs> things, but at the time, we were getting a glimpse of what was going on at the other side of the continent. I had come to MIT to study economics, but I also come to get a better understanding of the minds and research processes of creative geniuses. To have Solo, Aero, Samuelson, and Modiani as teachers in my three semesters of courses at MIT was really mind-bending. But perhaps because it was so different from all the others, uh, Ken's course was particularly mind-bending. So mind-bending that uh, by the time of the end of the course, uh, I uh, was one of two students left in, uh, left in the course. Um, but it meant, it meant that I had uh, a chance to have uh, a closer uh, interaction with Ken. Uh, actually, half of my coursework that semester was about Arrow. For Bob Solo, uh, used as a text for his advanced theory course that year, Arrow's beautiful Johansson lectures um, on some aspects of the theory of risk bearing that uh, Manny just talked about uh, before. Um, it was the third lecture. Manny talked about the second lecture. It was the third lecture uh, on adverse selection and moral hazard that was to set me off on my life's work. Uh, he said just enough to make it clear that the absence of information made a big difference. It was intriguing and unsettling. Uh, and here, I think, uh, some, several people have re, uh, commented that uh, in many of the areas where he made, had enormous influence, he didn't write down the model, but he was giving a reflection. Uh, 
And um, I think that was great for those of us, because if he had written down the model, we would have nothing uh, to do for our life. And uh, when I was an undergraduate, um, I uh, uh, remember the excitement of studying Keynes, but also feeling uh, uh, frustrated because I, I thought, wouldn't it have been great to do what Keynes did, but he had already done it. So I couldn't do it. So I had, you know, with it, and you had the feeling that maybe uh, uh, economics had been solved in some way. And I, um, I, I, I know this is a, um, a, the good thing is it's never solved, but I don't know if you remember uh, Bob Lucas's um, uh, presidential address to the American Economic Association, where he said, the problem of the business, this was uh, about 2005, he said the problem of the business cycle had been solved. Uh, <laughs> um, that's He's something you, off. what? Here's you off. Yeah, yeah, so um, uh, I, I think it's, uh, but, but as you, when you're young, you, you, you have the sense that you read these beautiful models and, and the answers seem beautiful and the question is what are you going to do? And it was King's, our uh, uh, lectures, uh, the, particularly the third lecture, that made it clear that there was an awful lot to do and that he hadn't bo bothered to do it. It was clear that he could have done it, but that he hadn't, and so he left it, I think, maybe deliberately for, for something for uh, the rest of us to do. Uh, he had already set out in his paper on healthcare some of the basic economics of moral hazard. It's already been referred to, and I, um, it was clear, though, that this and the theory of adverse selection uh, represented a key set of ideas. And it, this is something that's already been commented on, but I, I, th I think it is important. Arrow, who had effectively closed a 200-year chapter in the development of economics, the precise formulation of the general equilibrium model, which is at the core of modern economics, proving the existence of equilibrium and its efficiency, had in fact opened up a new chapter with profound implications. This is one of the things that I most respected about Ken. He could have rested on the laurels of what he had done in general equilibrium theory. Few economists would, though, have gone on to undermine the very edifice of which his work was the crowning glory. So while he got the Nobel Prize for general equilibrium theory, much of his later work was explaining why that model was not a good model. Um, and uh, it takes a certain amount of courage to, to spend your life explaining why what everything everybody thinks is your great contribution was actually the wrong model. Um, he understood deeply the conditions that were required to make a competitive market efficient. And he understood that those conditions were not satisfied in practice. And much of his work went on to elaborate more specifically on the important ways that markets departed from the benchmark model in the presence of imperfect information. Uh, and indeed, in the brief Mabo Nobel Memorial autobiography, he notes that most of his work in one way or another dealt, and this is his words, with information as an economic variable both uh, to, as to its production and as to its use. So it was interesting that when he, when he was asked to write a summary of the things besides general equilibrium, he, he saw information at its core. There's one other topic uh, he mentioned that I'll, I'll come to a little bit later. Uh, as luck would have it, I became invited to an annual summer workshop at Stanford called IMSSS that everybody's been uh, referring to. Uh, and uh, I would faithfully go out to Stanford no matter where I was. It was a shot of adrenaline that lasted the rest of the year. Of course, there was some intellectual sparring but the moments that mattered were when Ken spoke. He spoke in a way that you could feel him working through the problem, solving in his mind a complex problem yet to be fully written down. Identifying the presence of forces or considerations of which others had not yet even had a glimmering. The talks today have described the range of areas in which Ken made major contributions. But they touch on only a fraction of the topics, and over the years, as I flitted from one topic to another, whatever the area, Ken had made a seminal contribution. The analysis of risk, social capital, the economics of discrimination, the economics of education, organization theory, the theory of consumer behavior, when relative incomes are uh, what people <coughs> care about, the list goes on. I don't want to duplicate what has already been said this morning, 
or what will be said this afternoon. So I want to pick up on a couple of areas besides the economics of information, where, uh, or including the economics information, where my own work overlapped. Uh, I'll say a little bit more about the economics of discrimination in my discussion this afternoon at Glenn Lowry's talk, which I hope all of you go to. Uh, that was a subject that was uh, particularly close to King's heart, as I hope uh, Manny Yari can perhaps tell us uh, this afternoon, or maybe if you want a, 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 a brief interlude now, uh, I'm sure Manny will, you wanna, why don't you talk about it now, Manny? About your first day as a graduate student at Stanford. And do you, you don't remember? <laughs> <laughs> and you came to talk to Ken, and that evening you went down to San Francisco. Well, why don't you say the story rather than my telling it? And you say it in such a long-winded way, so that... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Here, carry the microphone to him. This was after a few days after I had come to Stanford to be Kenneth Arrow's student. Uh, all of 37 years old that he was at the time. And, uh, <clears throat> and after presenting myself to him, I decided it, it was time to go and see the city, uh, the glorious city, uh, namely San Francisco. So at the first weekend, I... Uh, uh, drove to San Francisco and the first uh, thing I remember is driving down Market Street in San Francisco in, uh, <coughs> in a $49 uh, Ford. Uh, I remember that because I, I uh, bargained it down from 50 so <laughs> It's probably my, my greatest bargaining coup <laughs> ever. And uh, so here I was driving down Market Street and I came up uh, uh, at a store, a Woolworth store, right there on Market Street. And, uh, and lo and behold, there was a <coughs> picket line of people picketing Woolworths and uh, <coughs> urging people not to, uh, not to enter the Woolworth store because they had uh, segregated lunch counters in the South. So there they were, and <coughs> when I take a closer look, I see that one of the pickets was Kenneth Arrow holding up a sign saying, uh, don't, don't uh, patronize Woolworth. And I was really taken aback, having come from uh, a country where, <coughs> where uh, higher education was done on the continental model. <laughs> and you were, not, you were not supposed to see your professor out picketing a store. And so I double parked the car and ran over uh, to, and, and really, with great uh, excitement, and I said, Professor Arrow! And he put his sign down and said, did something happen? <laughs> and when I reassured him that nothing had happened, this all was my delight at seeing him. He just picked up his sign and went on picketing. That's the, that's the end of the story. Is that what you... <laughs> Is that what you meant? Yes, yeah. Right. But I, I wanted... <laughs> but, uh, uh, just one more. His, his, <laughs> see, I'm long-winded. Uh, his record in protecting and protesting for human rights and protesting violations of human rights worldwide, not just in, in this country, 
is a very important uh, element of his legacy. I just wanted to add that. That, that was really what I wanted to uh, uh, convey, and that he was, we all know him as a great scholar, uh, but there is this, uh, many other dimensions, I'll mention some of them, but this, uh, this particular one was, was really uh, important to, to him. But he also brought that into his life. He wrote a number of articles about discrimination, uh, uh, which I'll talk about uh, the, uh, this afternoon, and Glenn will talk about. But uh, it's interesting, again, go back to his own autobiography. The one area outside of general equilibrium theory and information economics that he cites in his autobiography is discrimination, modestly saying another area of study was the economics of racial discrimination. So uh, this was uh, an area where he made uh, important contributions and, and it was where he brought together some of his very deep uh, commitments and his intellectual uh, life. One way of understanding Keng's research program more broadly was that it was a systematic attack against the competitive equilibrium model, explaining the multiple ways in which that model failed to provide a good description of the key areas of our economy, whether it was in the healthcare sector, the economics of rela race relations, the organization of the firm, education, or research. It was markedly different from one of the other dominant research agendas of the time, trying to use a variant of the general equilibrium model to explain everything from the time individuals spent brushing their teeth to education to discrimination. Those of you who don't know, uh, this is uh, Gary Becker in the Chicago School's legacy where they would actually uh, try to explain uh, by rational decision making how much time people spent uh, on each of their activities. This was an agenda um, uh, which, uh, though was particularly centered around Chicago, Kent confronted Rayleigh on his own campus at the Hoover Institution, where Becker, Stigler, and Friedman regularly came as visitors. One of the several distinctions that Kent and I had in common were that we had the experience of being token liberals at the Hoover Institution. Um, I think uh, he felt, like I did, that it was important to know deeply their arguments to understand the flaws in their reasoning. Of course, he had been even closer to the Chicago School. He had spent time writing his thesis at the Coles Commission, then located in Chicago, which later moved to Yale. One of the attractions of my accepting a position at Yale as an assistant professor was that I would be joining the Coles Commission with its illustrious history of economists, including, uh, and particularly Ken. Perhaps somehow the aura of that institution would provide <laughs> inspiration. I do think that somehow being at places like Coles and Stanford that were not established institutions with a dominant ideology gave Ken the space to explore and exercise his creativity. He had had the best of both worlds, enough time spent established in established places to learn the par prevailing paradigms, enabling him to speak to economists in ways that they could understand, but not enough to destroy his creativity. As I mentioned earlier, as he thought about the failings of the standard model, his consideration of information rose to the top. The two strands that he identified in his Johansson lecture are still the two strands that dominate the, uh, the literature, moral hazard and adverse selection. His pioneering work in moral hazard has already been discussed. His work on, on, on adverse selection was more limited and to my knowledge didn't address the particular issues posed by self-selection constraints. But in the late 60s and early 70s, when I was working on the theory of screening, he wrote a paper <laughs> emphasizing education as a filter. Uh, I called it a screen device. Uh, Mike Spen Spence, who was Ken's, uh, uh, Ken was, uh, his uh, thesis advisor, called it uh, signaling. While the mechanisms differed slightly, the result was the same. The observed private returns to education might not arise from human capital, but from sorting and the social return might be less than the private return. Uh, it threw into question the standard analyses attempting to estimate the social returns to investments in education by comparing incomes to those with different levels of education. Uh, a little later uh, in the 1980s, I turned to think about advances in technology, and here too, Ken's uh, two papers of 1982 uh, were landmarks. Uh, each started a literature of its own, one on expenditures and R&D, the other on learning. Again, the equilibrium was not efficient. 
He grasped that the fixed costs associated with research or information gathering in general imposed barriers to having the fully competitive general equilibrium model that he had studied uh, earlier. Um, uh, it is also, he realized that, that knowledge was like a public good and that because it was a public good, it, the efficient provision could not be done in a private market. Um, and the first aero lecture here at Columbia, which was presented by Bruce Greenwald and myself, uh, we called it Creating a Learning Society, took up the profound implications of Arrow's second paper on learning by doing. In particular, uh, the implications for development uh, uh, processes. So uh, what was remarkable, in 1982, he wrote two papers which, which really defined the, the theory of, of technological pros, pros, uh, uh, ch change, one on learning by doing and one on uh, explicit expenditures uh, on R&D. And uh, the, 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 both of these have generated a, a huge literature. Where at the Stanford um, uh, uh, Colloquium, um, one of the, uh, there was one of the researchers who had def uh, devoted her life to working on research and complained that uh, this strand of work had not been uh, adequately ad represented at all. In, in but the problem is, and I wasn't critical at all, because uh, the problem, no one day can fully reflect every strand uh, on which uh, Ken worked. Uh, they asked me to talk a little bit about some of my own research. So let me just pause for a minute here and, and talk about some of my more recent work or some of the work um, uh, on um, adverse selection and moral hazard. Um, one strand of work that I did uh, uh, some while ago uh, picked up one of the aspects of Ken's work where as he recognized that markets uh, often failed, uh, the question was, would non-market institutions step up and fill the breach? In other words, uh, take particularly the case uh, as an example, the issue of uh, moral hazard led to the constraint on the amount of insurance that firms would provide because with full insurance, people wouldn't advocate, uh, wouldn't have any level of effort, so you restrict the level, the quantity of insurance, and that would lead to, um, uh, 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 that, that, that would lead to um, uh, uh, insufficient, an inefficient level uh, of, of insurance, um, of, of uh, care. So the market equilibrium would be characterized by um, uh, rationing, but when there is rationing, incomplete insurance, there was, he, he suggested, an incentive for non-market institutions to come in and fill the gap. Uh, and that's obviously true. But that raised the question, would the non-market institutions make things better or worse? Uh, and uh, it wasn't obvious whether they made things better or worse. <coughs> they made things better on the one hand because the individual had more insurance than they otherwise would. They didn't have, they have, there was imperfect uh, risk sharing. But they made it worse because the reason we didn't want to have insurance, more insurance, was it led to less care. So the non-market institutions would uh, uh, lead to less care. So the question is, how do these two forces uh, balance out? Well, Richard Arnott and I uh, got uh, a very simple result in a, in a, uh, a very, uh, say, simple model where, where we talked about uh, the non-market institution being the family. Uh, we didn't want to suggest that this was, providing insurance was the only reason for families, but uh, it was one of the services that uh, families provided. Uh, and you know, typically, uh, when uh, the husband uh, or the uh, is no longer able to work, the wife doesn't throw him out or not, not right away. So that there are um, when one person gets sick, the other one uh, continues to to provide uh, income. So there was some uh, smoothing along the lines that was uh, you talked about uh, earlier within the family. So what we were able to show is in that context 
that actually uh, families or uh, non-market risk sharing was dysfunctional. It lowered, it, 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 it crowded out market insurance and the level of welfare was reduced if the family didn't monitor closely what uh, the individual did. But if they did, effectively the uh, insurance company could free ride on the monitoring service provided by the family who could observe things that the insurance company couldn't observe and then the welfare uh, was greater. So that's you know, one set of uh, research that, that uh, some of his work inspired. Uh, that set of issues leads very naturally to um, another set of questions. Um, the nature of uh, these non-market institutions uh, is that uh, they, insurance firm can't observe them. Because if the insurance firm could observe them, they would constrain the amount of non-market insurance. So one of the things that uh, Mike Rothschild and I did when we have, were doing our work on adverse selection is we assumed exclusivity. And uh, the reason we assumed exclusivity was that one can show uh, that in the absence of exclusivity that uh, uh, in these models, there's no equilibrium. So if you, if you just reformulate the model more generally and say, let's say that a, a insurance firm could offer secretly an insurance policy at the odds of the high risk person, which uh, would always break even and could make a profit, then uh, not only would the Rothschild equilibrium not be an equilibrium, but there in fact is no equilibrium in, in the standard uh, adverse selection model. Well, uh, that raised uh, uh, a, a, a very uh, uh, deep issue, a uh, difficult issue. Um, well, what happens? Because we see insurance markets. We know that people can get some insurance uh, secretly, not with not full disclosure. The example of the family is, uh, is one. And just from a theoretical point of view, uh, how, how could it be, that, you know, it, these results were too strong, too negative, that there were no markets. Well, that was a question but Jerry James and, and I both different, uh, differently uh, worked on. Uh, and uh, the way we approached it is asking, can there exist an e equilibrium if there is endogenous information? That is to say, where every agent makes a decision about whether to disclose or not to disclose. And uh, the particular work I've been working on with Yung Go Yun it has asked the question, not only, uh, when I say every agent, every firm can make a decision about what, whether to disclose information, and if so, what information to disclose, and every consumer can make a decision about whether to disclose and what. And in that context, it turns out that there always exists an equilibrium, even when the standard uh, single crossing property doesn't, isn't satisfied. You don't need the single crossing property. It's a very, very general result that there always exists an equilibrium, but that equilibrium entails a pooling contract the best pooling contract that uh, um, the low risk person prefers, plus the supplemental contract uh, that brings the high risk person to full insurance. It's the equilibrium that Jerry uh, described in one of his early uh, papers. So uh, uh, I think I, I find this very interesting that it, you know, we, we've had some discussion today about how more recent results so overturn some of the earlier results. So this, this says that the pooling equilibrium always exists. It entails asymmetries in disclosure, that uh, there is not full disclosure of the same information to everybody. And so to support the pooling equilibrium, you need uh, uh, a mechanism that leads to asymmetric uh, information disclosure. Um, 
so that's one of the uh, uh, areas where where um, um, I think uh, uh, research has been continuing uh, on uh, the work that Arrow uh, originally set out. Um, one of the uh, uh, other areas, there are a lot of areas, which is so remarkable that in many ways uh, the, the top, the questions that Ken posed uh, have been uh, a fertile field for people to work on for now, you know, more than a half a century. Uh, another one uh, that, in which there's, I think, relatively little work, Pierre uh, Andre has done some, some work, on t models in which there's both moral hazard and adverse selection. Uh, and when there are both of these present, the equilibrium looks different from either the moral hazard or the adverse selection. So there's a huge literature on each of these. When you combine them together, not surprisingly, when you have uh, binding constraints, self-selection and adverse selection constraints all the time, uh, things are much more complicated. And, but uh, you can still, with enough sweat, figure it out. And when you do that, it turns out that the equilibrium can look different from either of those uh, two uh, 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 models that have been studied uh, in, uh, in isolation. Um, let me go on and talk about some other aspects of, of Ken. Uh, Ken was not just an economist. He wanted to understand our society, and this has been brought up a number of times. Uh, that was evident in his thesis, Social Choice and Individual Values. Um, uh, as, as was already been noted by Eric, um, he had actually planned to, to uh, originally thought about writing about the theory of the firm and the collective decision making on the part of the firm. Uh, and uh, uh, one of the questions that, uh, again, uh, Arrow's work posed to me early uh, on in my uh, career was uh, the question of when would there be unanimity among all shareholders about what the firm wants? Uh, would one find, you know, we, we always talk, when would it be the case that all shareholders would want the firm to maximize shareholder value or any other criteria. Uh, and of course, when all agree, then of course the problem of social choice doesn't exist. And what Sandy Grossman and I were able to show was that the only conditions under which that would be generically true was when there were a full set of arrow to Bruce securities. So this is important because of the, uh, there's a, uh, uh, the issue that, that was raised earlier by Oliver. Um, the legal structure in the United States under Milton Friedman was changed. Uh, it had been that firms uh, had a broader mandate than just shareholder value maximization. And in Europe, uh, they still have, uh, in many European countries, this what's called stakeholder capitalism. They have to worry about their workers. The workers actually have representation on the board. And they have to worry about the communities. And um, the, the legal structure in the United States had been much broader. And it really shows you how the influence of an ideology, <gasps> not based on economic science, an ideology that uh, value maximization was uh, welfare maximization, which was true if there were a complete set of error to Bruce securities, but there aren't. And so uh, that view um, began uh, a massive public onslaught, uh, uh, changed, uh, you might say, the way corporate governance in the United States in ways that led eventually to a lot of short-sightedness on the part of firms. And so uh, uh, I've been arguing that th this is actually one of the reasons contributing to the growth of inequality in the United States, but also uh, to why our economy has not been performing as well uh, as it did uh, uh, before these changes uh, had occurred. Well, uh, in the end, Ken decided to focus not on this problem of firms, but on societal decision making. I suspect if he had spent more time explicating the implications of his results for firms, 
Perhaps the profession would not have gone down the direction in which it has, in which these questions have been given uh, such short shrift. His broader interest in the functioning of our society led him to think and write a little about social capital, an idea which Glenn Lowry helped introduce into the social sciences with his pathbreaking work beginning with his thesis, and uh, which I'll, he'll talk about a little bit uh, this evening. When I was chief economist of the World Bank, we had a conference in social capital and development to which uh, Ken contributed. Uh, he, like Partha Dasgupta, with whom both of us frequently collaborated, saw this within the context of repeated games. And he saw how there can be uh, what might be called dark equilibrium. Equilibrium which could help support exclusionary behavior, a behavior which work to the disadvantage of, of groups, and it could support equilibrium like Jim Crow. So um, uh, maybe uh, uh, one of the things that, that uh, Ken wrote about in uh, one of his articles about discrimination was that um, uh, he thought it was so obvious that, you ha that there was discrimination going on in our country, that he didn't think you needed empirical research to prove it. And what was so interesting was that uh, here you had Gary Becker writing uh, just a little bit before that and saying basically discrimination was inconsistent with a competitive equilibrium. And by implication, we were in a competitive market and therefore there wasn't discrimination. Uh, I grew up in Gary, Indiana, which was 30 miles from uh, 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 University of Chicago, and my feeling was if he just walked out of his out of his office uh, and walked about two blocks, uh, he would have seen what was going on. If he talked to somebody, uh, this is Gary Becker, he would have seen that uh, there was uh, massive discrimination going on. Um, I, um, I I I uh, really like the presentation. Uh, uh, this, uh, this morning uh, by Ulrika about how events early in life uh, can affect one's thinking throughout. I grew up in Gary, Indiana, and so I saw discrimination in Gary, and I continue to see it everywhere. Uh, and, and so it's, it's been something that, you know, maybe if you grow up in a rich suburb, uh, you see the world in, in, a, in a little bit different, different way. And if you, uh, even if you were in the south side of Chicago in the bubble, which is at the University of Chicago, you can avoid, if you work very hard, uh, uh, what is going on. But I have to say, I think you have to work very hard. Uh, Stanford makes it easier. Um, <laughs> uh, Ken had a philosophical bent. Uh, perhaps it was, oh, one more thing about the World Bank uh, and the, uh, 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 this uh, colloquium at Stanford a, a month ago uh, in the, uh, that illustrates one, another aspect of Ken, which is uh, his conscientiousness and his diligence. Um, during that, that uh, 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 colloquium, uh, there was a, a repeated reference to a paper on general equilibrium that Ken was writing for the World Bank and that he was trying to finish as he was in the hospital. And um, various people said, oh, they saw a draft of it. It was a, it was a, a, a subject of some discussion. Uh, and eventually, uh, I figured, uh, it, it, it came to me, I was at the World Bank when he gave the, the draft of the paper, the talk of the paper. It was a, a conference that I gave a paper and that he gave a paper on. And it was a paper about general equilibrium and trying to see <coughs> what, uh, the implications for development and uh, where general equilibrium theory was going. So the good news is there's a copy of it. It's going to be published, actually, in uh, the World Bank uh, volume, which is uh, uh, the conference collection. It won't be uh, the same as if he had been able to finish it, but it will be uh, a draft of what, of what he said. Um, and that was, uh, those of you who would go to conferences with Ken, uh, he'd have scribbled notes and, um, uh, you know, we, we were always scribbling our notes to scribble down what ideas that he was saying. We always thought it would be more efficient if he Xeroxed his notes and, and uh, shared them. But this is the way academics uh, do things. Uh, 
Ken had a philosophical bent. Perhaps it was just that he had thought deeply about the implications of everything. Every year, at least until recently, Ken would go to Rome to the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences, joining Partha Descripta, me, Edmund Malmbo, and others for discussions about social justice, society, and economy, touching on issues such as intergenerational equity, globalization, and climate change. Uh, beyond doubt, the deepest remarks were those of Ken. I always thought there was something humorous about this uh, uh, particular collection of, uh, uh, at the you have to understand the setting of the Pontifical Academy with uh, Partha, who, an Indian, me, uh, and Ken, who are Jews, and uh, 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 Edmund Malinvo, who is a, a very straight up uh, uh, French uh, scholar, uh, who, who lectured me regularly about not being able to speak French. Um, <laughs> and, uh, um, but we, it was, it was a, um, uh, a, a real uh, interesting, uh, we spent a week together, uh, almost a week, um, sleeping, uh, spending a monkish week in the Vatican, sleeping in the very hostel, hostel where the cardinals who elect the new pope do, and meeting in a beautiful <coughs> building which scholars like Al Leo have met for centuries. And how back, as we thought about back then, if we crossed the church, our future, not just as scholars, but our lives might have been put at risk. Uh, Ken had a curiosity to meet people who in the ordinary course of life, as an economist, one would not meet. And he had a commitment to make the world a better place. He thought it important that we devote some time to think about these big issues and to understand how others saw them. Uh, I do think efforts, uh, uh, where Ken and Partha played a particularly big role, efforts to get the church behind the climate change agenda played an important role in building up the momentum that actually led to, uh, to the Paris Accord. I don't know if, how many fill up, uh, followed this, but uh, there was a, uh, a papal encyclical about climate change, a really very different, you know, and that followed a meeting that we have between the Pontifical so Academy of Social Sciences and Pontifical Academy of Sciences and that really pushed uh, the, the, and you have to remember in the world that there are uh, about a billion people that belong to this particular organization. So getting this organization behind you has uh, some influence in moving uh, the global agenda. And I think both of us, you know, we all felt that this, um, whatever, you know, uh, uh, if we could get a billion people to support this view, it was uh, an important uh, move in the right direction. Ken was, as I've said, a person committed to causes. He saw economics, well done, as contributing to a better society. And he knew the power that someone of his intellect and prestige could give to the issues of the day in which he believed. He served with me for years as a trustee of the Economist for Peace and Security. He was active in building bridges uh, between the Soviet Union and the United States and the West during the Cold War, and was concerned about the transition from communism to a market economy. One of the, uh, you might say, amusing moments during the Stanford event was a heated discussion between Bob Solo and Larry Summers, uh, Ken's uh, nephew, uh, uh, and Anita's uh, son. Uh, Ken and Bob had signed a letter raising concerns about the privatization process in Russia as that country was moving towards its 1995 <coughs> election where Yeltsin was reelected. Um, Larry was the Undersecretary of Treasury and played a key role in America's position in the uh, transition that led eventually to Putin and to a privatization that created the oligarchs. Uh, that letter was, uh, as one might say, unhelpful to the U.S. position, but uh, as Bob Solo said, it reflected the right economic <coughs> position. Uh, and uh, I had only wished as that discussion was going on, Ken had been there to, um, uh, to, to articulate his view about these conflicts between politics on the one hand and, and the direction and economics and, and uh, when and where you pull back on your economics view because of the possible uh, political con uh, consequences. But I think in the end, if Ken had been there, I have to think he would have agreed with Bob Solo and, and, uh, on that side. Ken early on came to realize the seriousness of the threat of climate change. Um, and uh, I wound up uh, being in charge of uh, one of the three groups 
uh, in the IPCC, the Internet Governmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, there was one on the science. That wasn't the part I was in charge of. Uh, but there was one on economics and social implications. And so um, um, that, that um, uh, so one of the big issues in climate change is the rate of discount. Uh, because the effects of climate change are going to be felt over a very long time. And if you use a rate of discount, which was then being used by the U.S. government of like 7 percent, what happens in 50 years doesn't matter. And that was leading many people to say we shouldn't do anything about climate change. Um, Ken and I thought that was wrong. And of course, if you thought it was wrong, that meant you had to have a lower discount rate, and that meant you had to think about why you wanted uh, a lower dis discount rate. And um, uh, so uh, I got Ken to collaborate with me and some others to write a paper for the 1995 assessment arguing, explaining why you want a low interest rate, even possibly a negative interest rate. It has to do with uncertainty and correlations uh, between uh, uh, the stakes of nature, <coughs> when, the sta when, when the bad events happen, when climate change turns out to be much worse, that's exactly the stakes when your marginal utility is very high. And once you recognize this, you realize that it is very easy to get a negative uh, discount rate. And uh, so we, ma we managed to get this perspective into uh, the volume. Um, uh, the, uh, this was but, but one of the many ventures that Ken and I got involved in jointly. Back in December 1980, as China began its transition from communism to a market economy, the Chinese government, through the Academy of Social Sciences, reached out to the National Academy of Sciences, and Ken and I were among a small group that went to a conference in Wingsbrooks in Wisconsin to reflect on how China might best manage that transition. And then we made a return trip to China the following summer. I remember vividly Ken and I arguing for a path of transition with an emphasis on creating the institutional foundations for a market economy, supporting a competitive economy, a gradual path markedly different from that later taken by the former Soviet Union. I don't know how much what we was said affected the critical decisions that were subsequently made, but if they had even a small effect on what turned out to be one of the most important events in human history, the moving out of poverty of 800 million people, Ken's contribution to global social welfare on that account alone was enormous. It was, back, it was when I came back to Stanford in 1988 that I began to know the many facets of Ken and to become close to Ken and Selma. I suppose the moment that I knew I had earned his trust was when he allowed us to babysit his favorite goldfish while the little <laughs> pool outside his home was being reconstructed. Um, we had a, 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 a goldfish pond in our, in our house, so we took the, the goldfish from his and put him in ours. And um, when I gave the talk at Stanford, I pointed out that I was pleased, this is what I said, I, uh, um, I was able to return the fish in good health to their home uh, with the arrows. Uh, as I said this, uh, John Chauvin, who was my next door neighbor, spoke up and he said, are you sure they were the same goldfish? <laughs> And um, that got me uh, nervous. worried, nervous. Um, you know, goldfish all look a little bit the same. Uh, and uh, and it, it, it uh, actually uh, made me think about what Manny was saying, how, you know, 40 years, your memories are not perfect. Uh, and I had been uh, focusing, I, I know zero minutes, uh, I had been focusing on the ecological balance in my pond, uh, in my uh, uh, goldfish, which was very difficult to maintain in Stanford and uh, took a lot of work making sure you didn't get an algae bloom or, you know, there are a hundred, those of you who have goldfish uh, know how delicate these things are. And I had succeeded in doing that and therefore I thought I had uh, delivered on my promise. But there are more ecological uh, uh, problems. Um, and so after John raised his question, uh, his uh, I just wondered what he had in mind. I asked my daughter uh, what she remembered. Uh, 
And um, their memory, they're being a little fresher, uh, same distance in time, but uh, 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 was that uh, across the street there was a park in which there was a blue heron uh, who lived who thought our fish pond was food, was, was being uh, raised, ra purpose was to raise food for uh, the blue heron. So uh, the suspicion was that in fact, I'm sorry, uh, David, I, 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 I don't know whether they were the same fish. I guarantee you they were the same fish. Oh, thank you, thank you. I've been, this has been troubling me for, for <laughs> since, okay. This has been troubling me since, uh, since the Stanford event, okay. Um, uh, it was also mentioned before that uh, uh, there was a play re uh, that, that uh, Ken was a great conversationalist, which is really true. I mean, he was the person to have in, in a, dinner, a dinner party. And one of the things we had was a regular play reading group. Uh, and uh, this included Partha and Carol, and uh, we were constantly amazed by his uh, legendary memory. He knew not only where the play was per first performed, but who played what part, and for his insights into the meanings of what we were reading. Ken was a humanist cloaked as a mathematical social scientist. Uh, Ken was also a good sport. One evening in Seoul during the East Asia Econometric Society meeting, Ned Phelps had arranged to have Ned, Ken, and me taken out by one of his former PhD students who successfully followed my dictum that the most important decision one makes in life is choosing the right parents. Uh, <laughs> He had uh, inherited, uh, the student of, uh, of uh, Ned's had inherited uh, one of the Chaibo Kumho, who owned Asiana Airlines. Um, and uh, he treated us that evening to a, a wonderful, uh, I don't know if you, uh, uh, meal in one of these uh, uh, rooms with only you know, four people and, and uh, music and all that. But uh, the evening culminated in karaoke. Um, with Ken throwing himself into the spirit, uh, even, uh, um, and Ned, I don't know if, uh, how many of you know, uh, Ned loves uh, singing, and in fact, uh, 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 invites us over to, uh, I'm tone deaf, so, so I find this deeply embarrassing, but, but uh, Ken really did enjoy this particular evening. Did Ned still like singing after the evening? Yes, he does, <laughs> yes, Ned, Ned continues to have these events. Well, finally, let me just mention, when I left the World Bank and went to Columbia, it occurred to me that there would be multiple benefits of creating an annual lecture in honor of Ken. Ken was, by any measure, Columbia's most distinguished PhD, and I thought it would be good for our students to know what they should aspire to, as, as uh, uh, was just Mike mentioned before, uh, what a good PhD looked like. Um, and I hoped it, that it would provide a context in which Ken, Selma, and I could get regularly get together. I had been warned about how hard it was to sustain such a lecture series. But Ken was unique. His writings covered such a wide range and with so many devoted students, colleagues, friends, and admirers, it proved easy to establish an intellectually thriving and animating series, many of the contributors to which are here today. Most remarkable was how Ken came every year. Um, and as he came, he commented on the paper, giving us some glimpses of how he came to write the paper that was the inspiration of that year's lecture, and uh, what was his inspiration in writing it. Uh, last year's lecture by John Ginnacopoulos uh, was to be his last. Perhaps it was fitting that it was given on a topic so close to Ken's heart by someone who was himself so close to Ken and who had contributed a brilliant paper to Ken's festrip 30 years ago. Uh, the paper, uh, all of you should have read, was on uh, the Pareto inefficiency of the competitive equilibrium when there are not a complete set of risk markets. Uh, perhaps the reason I liked it is because it got the same result that Bruce Greenwald and I got, uh, but uh, with much uh, a more, I would say, better proof uh, uh, much more uh, formal proof, and I, one that Ken would have liked better. Uh, Ken's comments were as sharp as always, emblematic of the reverence, awe, and respect of Ken, was an email I received from a bright young Indian economist who had been visiting Columbia that day and managed to engage Ken for a few minutes that evening. He wrote that those moments would be among the, mo the moments 
he cherished, mo cherished most in his life. We all feel that the moments that we spent with Ken were among the most cherished in all of our lives. Thank you.